So, um, remember to study your notes. We're studying the notes we have today, study notes on seasons. If you were not here last time uh, because you had to leave class, rude, make sure you get the notes from someone else and hopefully the explanation of it too because just taking the notes isn't actually all that helpful. Today we're going to talk about um, El Nino and La Nina. So first, before we talk about that, sometimes El Nino and La Nina, well, El Nino specifically, is referred to as the Southern Oscillation. You may see that um, term pop up. And a lot of times we call it ENSO, which actually stands for E, Enya, S, O. So El Nino, Southern Oscillation. Before we understand that, we need to talk about low pressure and high pressure. So we have low pressure and high pressure systems. We talked about these briefly before, but low pressure tends to give us certain types of weather, while high pressure gives us other types of weather. So if we have a low pressure system, like you see in this diagram here, this is a very simplified version, low pressure, air tends to swoop into low pressure. It depending on the difference between the low pressure and the high pressure system, we'll have faster movement of that air creating winds. As we have that low pressure system, we have that low pressure system because air was moving up, rising up into the sky. As it does that, it brings up moisture and allows us the possibility of having clouds. So low pressure systems is a lot of times what we think about as bad weather. This is when we're having windy conditions or windy conditions and rain when we have storm clouds, we have snow, any kind of system, tornadoes, hurricanes, all of those are low pressure systems because air always moves to equal itself out. And so the high pressure will move to the low pressure system spreading itself out. As that rise up into the sky, we have a movement of the air outward and eventually it will cool, become less dense and it will sink and be dry and tend to be pushing out on the surface. This tends to be a sinking motion, so winds here aren't very fast. They tend to be really calm, if any winds at all, just because the air is literally sinking from above us. We'll have clear skies because the moisture was already created over here, and remember clouds are formed when moisture in the air, water vapor, condenses, and it condenses usually when it gets colder, it loses energy, so it can't stay in that gaseous phase. So here, we have cold air up here that as it sinks, it gets warmer. So we have a very unlikely situation of having clouds here. This is sort of a diagram just showing that same thing. It's air moving into these low pressure system and coming up into the sky, forming clouds, moving over to the high pressure, dropping, sinking, and having a high pressure system on this side. We talked about this a little bit too when we talked about our global circulations. Remember at zero degrees latitude, we tend to have these cloud forming at these regions and we have dry places here where we have most of our deserts at 30 degrees both north and south. This is a location, if you look here, where the Hadley cell meets the Ferro cell where dry cooler air is sinking and warming as it goes, but it's sinking creating a high pressure system here at this location, and here we have the air rising, creating a low pressure system because we're moving air from the ground. Air is swooping in and rising up there, creating this precipitation band that we have around in the tropics. Another pro high pressure, sorry, low pressure system would be a hurricane. Hurricanes have a very, very low pressure system. The lower the pressure is, the faster the winds move. The faster winds move over large surface areas, the more it's going to have that spinning motion or spinning action. Here's just an aerial shot of that. All right, so El Nino, La Nina, how does that all have to matter with low and high pressure? So this is what the, it's a diagram of the um, Pacific Ocean. So here we have New Guinea. If you don't know where New Guinea is, it's kind of off the coast of uh, Australia. So Australia is over here to the left and actually down south a little bit. And then we have the coast of South America. Normally, the trade winds, those ones that are in the tropics, are pushing and blowing across the Pacific Ocean. When it does this, the trade winds will move water out of this area. And since it's not Minecraft, water moves and it leaves a gap, but that gap is immediately filled in with water coming in from below. 
So we get, because of the trade winds, we get this circulation pattern of water moving in the ocean. Now this is really good for fish because when everything dies, all the nutrients eventually sink to the bottom of the ocean, which isn't very useful for any organism that lives in this photic zone, the light zone of the ocean. 90% of all of our organisms in the water live in the photic zone. So this upwelling process, this movement of the water by the trade winds pushes the water along, drops it down when it hits the coast here, and moves the water in this way, bringing cool water up to the surface. And that's a process called upwelling because it brings it, it wells it up. Hard word. Anyway, so as it does that, it also brings nutrients down from the depth, bringing it up to the surface. And so on the coast of South America is the best fisheries in the entire world. These fisheries have lots of nutrients for algae and the fish eat the algae and it's a very good fishing spot. As these trade winds move, because of this cold water, we get a compression of the air above here. So air wants to sink at this location. We get a high pressure zone right here. As the air moves this way, we have a rising of the air. So we have a low pressure system here allowing clouds to form here and allow to have dry desert conditions here. This is right here is the location of the Atacama Desert, the driest non-polar desert, Mr. Dodge, in the entire world. So it gets very, very, very little rainfall. Some years it records zero rainfall. So it gets no moisture and part of that is because of this upwelling action. This cold water off the coast compressing the air molecules, causing a high pressure system here reducing cloud formation and the fact that the trade winds are blowing moisture off the, the continent and blowing it towards the ocean that doesn't help either so here's kind of an aerial view of that a map view of it so we've got here south america we have the winds pushing this way we have circulation of the water below bringing upwelling cold waters off the coast of south america here and then we have the warm water is getting pushed off the coast and moving towards Australia. Warm causes a reduction in density, causing an increase in the air's movement, which causes it to be able to float above the other air layers and rise up, bringing moisture with it, creating clouds and all that jazz. All right, so if I look at that in diagram view, I've got that right here. I've got upwelling here. We've got the movement of the air here, rising air, sinking air. Now, if I look down for El Nino, during an El Nino year, systems change. These low and high pressure systems that control weather in these regions shift. What happens off the coast of South America is warm water will start to be next to South America. It starts to migrate across the ocean and that warm water that location of the warm water typically causes the movement of those rain systems those weather systems when we have that warm water there it stops that high pressure system we end up getting tons of rains on the South American continent there on the west coast and then we get dry conditions over here in Indonesia and in Australia it sort of switches the weather patterns we also get downwelling happening so we lose all of that chance to having that cold water next to the coast of South America which then in turn causes a shifting a further shifting of these uh, conditions so this is an El Nino condition and it's caused by just a change in temperature of surface sea temperatures specifically in the Pacific Ocean here is a map view. So these trade winds typically will be blowing across South America, pushing the warm water off towards Indonesia, allowing for rainfall in this region. But then during the El Nino year, this is how it changes. The warm shifts, it weakens the trade winds. The winds aren't blowing as hard because they're trying to find that low pressure system and the low pressure system has moved with the warm water. And then we tend to have um, weakened trade winds. In a very strong El Nino year, we can actually have a complete reversal of the trade winds. So the trade winds that are moving in this direction because the earth is spinning in that direction can literally change their direction and go the opposite way of the turning of the earth.
All right, so southern oscillation. This is what we're going to write down. So El Nino is a weather phenomenon that alters the usual weather patterns globally. It doesn't just alter the patterns in Australia, and it doesn't just alter the patterns in South America. It changes weather across the entire globe. Weather in Europe is affected. Weather in Africa, weather in California, everywhere is altered slightly due to this phenomenon. And it occurs because of a buildup of that warm water in the Pacific Ocean, weakening the trade winds and shifting and moving where that low and high pressure cells that cause our weather around in the air. It completely stops upwelling off the coast of South America and then further fuels the shifting of those light, low and high pressure systems. Pause the video if you need to more time to take notes. This results in a lot of consequences. One, it prevents upwelling of nutrients for fish, so it reduces fish populations. They either migrate or they move away from the region. Because if we don't have nutrients, we don't have NPK, we don't have algae. If we don't have algae, we're missing the base of the food chain and a lot of the fish will move. Besides the fact that most of these fish don't like warmer waters. They prefer to have the colder waters. Next thing that this causes is drought in Australia, Indonesia, and parts of Eastern Africa, places that we typically have rainfall. We're actually not gonna have that anymore. Next, it can cause a failure of the monsoon season. A lot of these countries that depend on the monsoon season for rain, it, without that monsoon season, we typically have crop failure um, and we have massive starvation. Next one would be flooding in the western U.S. and Peru. So California typically hits floods. Uh, we have floods occasionally from El Nino, but most of the time it hits during winter time. And so we end up getting a massive amount of snow, which helps a lot for our snowpack. Usually it's not as bad for us because it adds moisture to our area instead of removing moisture, which helps us. Um, but we have flooding in the western U.S., typically um, flooding in Peru. So Atacama Desert, completely dry. El Nino comes and we have tons and tons of rainfall. Europe and parts of Western Africa will flood as well. And then what's interesting is we actually have fewer hurricanes in the tro and tropical storms on the east coast of the U.S. And that's not necessarily because there's fewer forming, but it's because the trade winds aren't pushing as hard towards the eastern United States. They've been lessened. And so the tropical forms tend to fizzle out over the ocean instead of reaching landfall. Pause the video if you need more time. All right, let's go ahead and do draw this diagram of El Nino conditions. And actually, you should probably sketch in what normal conditions look like so that you know what that looks like as well. So sketch this in and label it normal conditions. Um, sorry, I can't really draw this with you guys. I don't have the equipment that actually lets me draw diagrams and then puts it into the computer today. I left it at home. Anyway, so what you're going to do is draw in this diagram the best you can. Pause until you get that done. Remember to label it normal conditions. Once you've got that done, go ahead and diagram in El Nino conditions. Now they call it El Nino because it typically happens around Christmas time every year when we start seeing the effects in Peru. And it lasts anywhere from like eight months to about 16 months when it happens. So it can shift and change sort of the climate in, not well, this is the climate, but it changes the, the weather in regions around the whole world, kind of temporarily changing climate during this time period. So El Nino, again, call it El Nino, the boy, because it often starts around December when it happens. And since it started around Christmas time, locals in Peru named it El, the El Nino phenomenon. Alright, 
La Nina. La Nina is pretty much the exact opposite condition of El Nino. It's characterized by unusually cold waters. El Nino was warm water and in the ocean. And instead of causing the trade winds to lessen or to reverse, it causes them to blow harder. So what this does is it brings moisture that would typically fall on the ocean and brings it more on to Australia, brings it more into Indonesia, and brings it more into the uh, eastern coast of the United States. So we typically see more hurricanes during the El Nino year. This recent area where we had Hurricane Maria and Hurricane Harvey and all of those hurricanes hit uh, the United States kind of like one after another after another and after two problems. One, the ocean temperature was a little bit warmer than normal. So the storms had a lot more energy than they typically had. And number two, it was a La Nina year. And so we were being hit one after the other because the winds were bringing them more inland and they were all hitting landfall when typically they would not. So La Nina, unusually cold water in the ocean, which causes the prevailing winds to blow harder and causes extreme upwelling. So fishing is awesome off the coast of Peru during this time. And a fish boom off the coast of South America. Pause if you need more time. This results in, again, almost the exact opposite of El Nino. If I were you, I would study El Nino, and the La Nina is the opposite, especially considering the El Nino and La Nina are opposing terms anyway, so it's helpful to remember it that way anyway. So it, it results in extreme upwelling. Dry conditions in the western U.S. An increase in tropical storms and hurricanes for the eastern U.S. Flooding in Indonesia and Australia. And then increases rains to the monsoon season. Now La Nina typically will follow an El Nino year. It's almost like El Nino dispenses all this heat energy that builds up into the ocean and just spews it out into the atmosphere. And we have all these rains and then we have a cold period after where La Nina happens. But La Nina actually doesn't happen as frequently as El Nino, which is a little strange. Um, it doesn't happen every time El Nino happens. And actually, most of often not. And... Um, What's interesting about El Nino and La Nina is El Nino isn't occurring on a perfect pattern. It's not reoccurring on a great interval. It used to appear every about 5 to 11 years or 7 to 11 years. It's happening more frequently now. El Nino is happening and occurring about every 3 to 6 years now due to the fact that the ocean sea surface temperatures are becoming warmer and warmer more often. There's more often an excess buildup of heat in the Pacific Ocean due to global warming. Uh, diagram for La Nina. So um, pretty much the same thing as you did for El Nino, except or for normal conditions, but you just make it stronger. So it pushes these storms off closer onto land. And so we get more water added to the monsoons. We get more water added to Australia. And then we just get tons and tons of water. Pause if you need more time to draw the diagram. All right, so you guys are going to do a lab on El Nino. Um, maybe if I can get the lab supplies put together fast enough. If not, you guys are going to watch a video on El Nino. It actually is a documentary talking about El Nino and why it is the way it is. Um, I'm telling you right now, it's already pretty late in the day. We're probably watching a video on it. But remember to study your notes. Get all that done. We'll review next time when you come back. But you should have studied before we review and then we're taking the quiz on this next section. All right, I'll see you guys on Wednesday.